are you doing? Fight it! Get down! They only have spears, don't they? No! Machine guns! Oh! This isn't the Sudan? No! It's not 1898? No! Belgium 1914! So I should be down there with you then! Yes! Come on! Hello and welcome to Bloke on the British Muzzleloaders range. I'm here with uh, Rob of the British Muzzleloaders channel in rural Western Canada. And uh, we thought we would uh, have a chat today about how we got from here to here. So thanks for hosting me. You're more than welcome. Pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Likewise. Pleasure to be here. Great honor to be able to work with the man himself. Right back at you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, right, so basically, um, Rob is equipped uh, as of the late 19th century, so we're talking Sudan, Boer War. I'm equipped as of 1914, First World War, and we we're having a discussion and we thought that uh, it'd be interesting to sort of see how the lessons, discuss how the lessons learned from the, particularly the Boer War, got us from here to here. So, do you want to take us through uh, Certainly. where you are? So, let's start with the hardware first, shall we? Mm -hmm. So I'm armed with a, uh, in this case, it's a Mark I Lee Metford that viewers of my channel will be uh, quite familiar with. But it's indicative of the type of rifle that was carried in, a, in the Sudan campaign of 1898. Mm -hmm. uh, it fires the 303 cartridge. In this case, it's the early marks of the cartridge, mm -hmm. uh, which had a velocity of around 2,000 feet per second using a round nose 215 grain bullet. Uh, it is magazine fed. Uh, this particular model has an eight round magazine and it has a feature known as a mag cutoff which uh, I personally on my channel have discussed in depth as well as on yours, as mm -hmm. I understand. So, uh, doctrine of the day regarding the weapon is single loading uh, with a magazine in reserve mm -hmm. for critical moments, mm -hmm. as it were. Uh, the enemy gets too close, uh, the enemy surprises you, you have an immediately available reserve with uh, a minimal amount of reconfiguration of the weapon that is at hand and can be delivered very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some, uh, many accounts, as a matter of fact, of the effectiveness in the right circumstances of this system in the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, the caliber is 303, so anybody who shoots any manner of uh, Lee rifle will be uh, intimately familiar with the cartridge. As I mentioned, uh, it shoots uh, in service. It shot a 215 grain bullet at 2,000 feet per second. Uh, not quite as fast as the ammunition that your rifle was intended to shoot, mm -hmm. uh, but we'll talk more about that in a bit. Yep. The equipment that I'm wearing is known as the Slade Wallace equipment or pattern 1888 valise equipment. Uh, it was the last generation of equipment made for the infantry in white buff leather, as you can see the color. Uh, at its most basic level, it carried 100 rounds, mm -hmm. uh, 50 in each of these pouches, which are of a later mark. Uh, in each pouch, there was 20 rounds loose, mm -hmm. uh, ready for immediate availability, plus three packets of 10 rounds in each pouch. Mm -hmm. So each pouch was identical that way. Um, for its designed purpose, I think these pouches particularly uh, came about as a result of the previous pattern pouches opening from the front and up. Mm -hmm. And uh, this led to spillage of ammunition and, and mm. the loss of it. Uh, these pouches open forward, and especially when in the prone position or in any kind of uh, less than kneeling mm. or standing, shall we say, this helps prevent spillage and loss of ammunition with that lid automatically wanting to close mm. back on top. Because it's quite, it's quite cupped, actually. Yes. Uh, part of the design feature was uh, a slit cut in the side of the, the, the top of the mm. lid here, which then formed a somewhat of a rounded shape over mm -hmm. the top of the pouch. Uh, the, the design's not perfect, mm -hmm. uh, but in an era when ammunition was carried, loaded, and used uh, singly, mm -hmm. uh, this had a balance of loose rounds ready for availability mm -hmm. immediately, as well as the packets for mm -hmm. later, and uh, at a pause or a lull, those packets would be then produced, mm -hmm. unwrapped, and then placed in the loops inside mm -hmm. the pouch to replenish uh, those that were fired. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the rest of the equipment goes, it's pretty standard. There's a water bottle, as mm -hmm. most soldiers will carry, as well as a haversack for food and other small and sundry items. Mm -hmm. uh, 
things like this were obviously uh, uh, climactic or in terms of theater oriented in a mm-hmm. hot, dusty desert and climate such as the Sudan. Then uh, foreign service helmets protect this uh, head from the sun, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And a relatively lightweight uh, khaki drill tunic mm-hmm. or frock, as the terminology of the day would indicate. Mm-hmm. And the usual rest of the gamut of a typical Highland soldier. Mm-hmm. So, uh, where did this go wrong in the Boer War? I mean, the, 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 the sort of popular view uh, was that the campaign was dominated, although it wasn't really quite the case, by long-range Boer marksmanship with 7mm model 1895 Mauser rifles, long rifles, in a sort of guerrilla war situation with a culture of marksmanship behind it. So there is a degree of truth to this, um, that there were lots of long-range engagements. So British infantry doctrine of the era was rather more sort of typical colonial warfare set up for that. And uh, yeah, it, well, you were telling me earlier, it, it, the myth of sort of red coats lining up Napoleonic style and marching towards a, uh, a high peak with Boer marksmen well hidden behind uh, rocks, that's not really the reality, is it? Uh, no, and if you look at uh, some of the, uh, the the accounts of battle and anecdotes, the, the tactics of the late 19th century were, uh, in, the, in a formal sense, in terms of manuals and, and doctrine, uh, geared specifically, and had been since the 1870s, mm-hmm. towards uh, operations in extended order. Mm-hmm. And what this means is, uh, instead of being lined up shoulder to shoulder, mm-hmm. uh, and being packed close together... Men are spread out, and by this time, uh, in, this, in fact, in a single rank, mm-hmm. at uh, anywhere up to uh, five paces between, four paces between men, mm-hmm. uh, but could then shrink down to uh, being quite close, one or two paces. Mm-hmm. Uh, that said, extension was a fundamental part of army business. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's important to caveat, though, that the interpretation of the manual in terms of what was actually practiced, especially uh, in home service, so mm-hmm. in Great Britain, in the UK, uh, sometimes did not reflect the spirit of the regulation. Mm-hmm. So that it said to do things a certain way, and in practice they were uh, exercised generally similarly. However, uh, extension and the space between individuals mm-hmm. sometimes was relegated to... Uh, the textbook mm. and what you find and in fact there's there's pictures uh, taken of uh, troops on maneuvers in the uh, 1890s and you can see them although they are extended they're in a mm. single rank and maybe even in the kneeling position mm. uh, in the face of the enemy they are in fact about as close as we are here together mm. so that uh, to the modern eye of course is horribly bunched yeah uh, so despite the fact that extension um, multiple layers of uh, uh, troops lined up but at intervals of 200, 300 yards between these mm-hmm. lines uh, was prescribed mm-hmm. in the manual. But what we see in the Boer War is perhaps instances where those drills would have been known to all generals, uh, all field officers, mm-hmm. and all junior officers. But decisions at times were made where those, uh, those drills, those evolutions had been intended to uh, be adopted, but later in, say, the advance. Uh, mm-hmm. One particular example of that is the Battle of Magers Fontaine. Mm. Uh, a night advance was prescribed, and the orders stipulated that the battalions that were to engage uh, in that advance were to stay in close column mm-hmm. uh, for control purposes, so that instead of extending in the middle of the night, and don't forget, this is the late 19th century, there was no such thing as you know luminous comp- compass dials uh, and this kind of thing. So... Maintaining control, cohesion, direction mm-hmm. was crucial to maintaining uh, or bringing those troops onto the enemy together mm-hmm. in a coordinated manner. And the decision was made then to advance in these close formations uh, to relatively close to the enemy. Mm-hmm. And what happened at Magnus Fontaine is the fact that, first of all, the reconnaissance was poor and they didn't realize that the Boers, instead of being on the top of the hill where they thought and they saw the, the dummy trenches, they were in fact at the bottom of the hill. Mm-hmm. And so when dawn broke, the Boers were, uh, were much closer. Mm-hmm. And this led to the, the tragedy that was the Battle of Magers mm-hmm. Fontaine, with the battalions of the Highland Brigade in particular being caught very close to the Boers, mm-hmm. who were then shooting uh, 
from a similar elevation mm -hmm. with uh, modern, I'm not going to say specifically Mauser rifles because at the range is engaged, it wouldn't have really matter what rifle mm -hmm. you were shooting. But in particular, instead of shooting down on them, they were shooting across at them. Mm -hmm. Their fire was low mm -hmm. and it would have, uh, in modern parlance, it would have been grazing fire. It would mm -hmm. have carried on so that uh, somebody at the front would still be uh, uh, obviously in danger and those at the rear would be in the same amount of danger mm -hmm. by the same bullet. Yeah. If it missed the, f the guy in the front, it would have hit the person in the back yeah. because that bullet wasn't raising uh, mm -hmm. above the level of a man at those ranges. Mm -hmm. And you see a brigade of infantry put to ground in daylight in close proximity to the enemy. Mm. They can't move, they can't deploy. Mm. So despite the fact that the tactics of extension and the, the multiple layers, the firing line, supports and reserve, that kind of tactical innovation was well known, it perhaps wasn't trained to the spirit of the mm. manual. Uh, and as a result, bad decisions, bad tactical decisions mm -hmm. were made by uh, generals and senior officers uh, and with the resulting tragedies. Mm. But it, I mean, let's just put it in context. People talk about the flat flying Boer Mauser cartridge. I mean, we're still in the round nose era. Uh, it's still a heavy bullet, even though it's seven millimeter. And it's doing 2,300 feet per second. Versus from, the 2,000 of the uh, yeah. Lee Metford Lee Enfield. It's not a massive difference. No. And compared to modern ballistics, and when we get on to uh, this, uh, that's, get, that, that's their modern ballistics modern ideas of, uh, of uh, flatness of trajectory. But even in open order, you can imagine advancing over open felt with Boer Ma Bo marksmen dug in that, to a large degree, uh, provided the, the, the range judgment was good, they must have been absolute sitting ducks. Uh, absolutely. That, uh, uh, nobody operated in that era on the battlefield alone. Mm. And despite the fact that uh, you may have been extended from your file mate to two or three or four paces. Mm -hmm. And as a side note, these lessons, although perhaps not uh, realized or remembered mm -hmm. at the beginning of the war, after those first serious defeats uh, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the war, there were some tactical navel gazing, as it were. Yeah. And there were immediate and ultimately successful uh, uh, modifications and re-emphasis on some of these principles. Mm -hmm. So you see then, uh, towards the close of the uh, uh, the formal campaign, before the guerrilla mm -hmm. campaign truly starts, uh, massive extensions, mm -hmm. 10 paces between individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, something that is very uh, modern to the, to the modern eye and mm -hmm. sensibility. Uh, and they found that this, in fact, worked. Massive extensions, and they could outflank the Boer positions, but also the danger to the individual and the group was reduced significantly mm. by those extensions. Uh, it took a lot longer to get to where you wanted to go because, of course, with more extension, your firepower is limited. Mm -hmm. And in order to increase that firepower, we have to uh, adopt a bit more of a gradual uh, dominance of mm -hmm. whatever enemy position in coordination with the artillery and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, despite these setbacks at the beginning of the war, the tactics, the spirit, as I alluded mm -hmm. to earlier, seems to have been grasped uh, and combined with other tactical innovations mm -hmm. and those formal campaigns, those set-piece battles mm -hmm. uh, against the Boers when they were standing as an army mm -hmm. were ultimately successful. And, I mean, and another thing with the, with the, the length of ranges of, uh, of engagement, it was uh, discovered out there that uh, a lot of the magazine Lee Enfields, so the ones intended for Cordite, uh, were extremely poorly sighted. They were. Uh, this is a, uh, a problem peculiar to the magazine Lee Enfield versus the magazine Lee Medford. Mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, the rifles essentially are the same, except mm -hmm. for the pattern of rifling. Mm -hmm. And when they adopted the Enfield rifling, uh, it, it, because of the problems with the cordite uh, wearing out the Medford barrels, mm -hmm. uh, unbeknownst to anybody until they actually put it in practice. Yeah. And it's important to realize, as a side note, that we're talking many thousands of rounds here yeah. to, to wear out a Medford barrel. And the annual qualification of a soldier would put a uh, number of rounds, uh, you know, under 100. Yeah. So how many years of annual shooting in peacetime yeah. would it take to wear out a Metford barrel? Yeah. Uh, I think the popular conception is you put, you know, a, f a few rounds, so maybe 100 or 200 rounds mm. through a Metford barrel, and it's worn out, it's mm. useless. So what we see is, in fact, Metfords in use until the, uh, through the entire Boer War. Mm. Well, and in training in the First World War. 
absolutely. as well. Which is also why a lot of them are pretty shot out today if you can find them because they were shot with cordite during what during the Boer War between the wars I and mean, they were obviously uh, phased out progressively but they, they've been relegated to training during during World War One even now uh, once we get up to here people accuse our channels of being Lee Enfield fanboys um, well uh, <clears throat> some more than others yes anyway um, Let's just say that the magazine Lee Metford and the magazine Lee Enfield were in no way, shape or form the best rifles on the battlefield there. The, uh, the 1895 Mauser beats the pants off them because charger loading. Absolutely. That more than velocity and yep. you know, sharp shooting, that in itself is the crux yep. of the matter. The ability to reload five rounds in one go and not, uh, not have to stuff them in one at a time. This really is the crux of the matter. And uh, if I was parachuted back in there and you put one or other in front of me and I could choose, I would take the Mauser, even though it's got a sticky out bolt handle, I will be able to take in a position and deliver much more sustained, accurate fire with that than with that A, better sighted, B, be, though they're both practical, practical uh, grouping size doesn't really make a lot of difference because the weak link in the chain is normally the shooter, certainly under combat conditions, but just charger loading. You just keep it up here. Once your magazine's out, you're down to single loading until you've got time to stuff round after round in there. And I know that in some ex experiments that I've con conducted is that it is faster to continue with single loading, yep. perhaps if you're in a static position. Uh, withdrawing a packet of ammunition and laying it beside you, knowing mm. you're going to be there for a while, and using it that way is much faster than rebombing the magazine, yep. firing the magazine, rebombing it, mm -hmm. and firing it in that regard. So, so once you've it'll exhausted that initial reserve, yep. you have to just maintain... It, the magazine l comes completely out of the picture. Mm. Now, there's a sort of chicken and egg question as to... Because the, the doctrine was based around the, the non-charger loaded magazine. Uh, Timing-wise... Uh, the Lee Metford predates any any adoption of charger loading. So, um, I mean, the first, off the top of my head, uh, the first actual charger loaded, rather than Mannlicher on block clip loadings come in in about 1889. There's the uh, the Belgian Mauser, and then the Schmidt Rubin 1889 comes in a couple of years later. Um, and that's really it's a game changer. But they're committed to the to the concept. It's it's not really so much of an issue in the sort of colonial warfare that was that was that was dominating which to be fair is as you say dominating that is especially the army of the era that is its primary function is policing mm. the empire mm -hmm. and do they need charger loading everything up to that date including uh, the battle of Omdurman in 1898 mm -hmm. uh, shows that the current doctrine the current weapons mm -hmm. are eminently effective yep i mean we're, we're talking poorly armed, poorly equipped, massed armies advancing typically over in, in this period. It's typically in open, in open country in, uh, in, in Africa. I mean, the, uh, the northwest frontier of India is, there's not, it was always dodgy, always things going on, but really the colonial warfare of the era was the Sudan and so on. Was that open uh, uh, one, Notwithstanding, mm. the, 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 the lessons that were learned, but not necessarily recognized at an army level, uh, from the Bataan Revolt of 1897 mm. on the Northwest Frontier. And that really was the watershed of the development of improved tactics and, as a result, uh, uh, weaponry. It, mm. it wasn't something that happened overnight. But when you look at the... Because uh, the 1897 revolt was the first uh, true test of mm. the small bore, in this case 303, mm -hmm. uh, magazine rifle. And there were some things that were found to be somewhat lacking, but... Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of that pertained to the, the, the tactics uh, that were used in terms of the delivery of the musketry. Uh, in general, however, the rifle performed well. Mm -hmm. uh, what they did have uh, to face were tribesmen that were not just the sword and spear armed masses, mm -hmm. that they were relatively well armed. Mm -hmm. And that is really the first time that a colonial power, with the exception of the Boers in the 1880s, mm -hmm 
uh, that a colonial, or sorry, a, 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 a native power, if you will, it has not comparable weaponry, mm. but enough to make a sting felt. Yeah. And for individuals and people and organizations to, I can't even say wake up, mm-hmm. but certainly it's recognized at some levels and especially by the army in India mm-hmm. that something's changing here. Mm. So, I mean, coming out of the Boer War, the, uh, the, the main lessons in terms of the rifle were charger loading. It was just like absolute must. There's no question anymore. Um, which has an inf- influence on the doctrine as well. Individual sighting of the rifles, both at the factory and to the soldier, if to the individual soldier, if needed, if if he could shoot well enough uh, to be to be permitted to zero his own rifle if it was if it was off, and the short rifle, the universal short rifle. Um, what you also see in the in the Boer War is mounted infantry carrying long lees on horseback, yes, riding to battle, dismounting and fighting dismounted. Uh, so when we put these three together we get the uh the i mean this is this is the sort of main smle model the final one charge a bridge on here we didn't get there in one step there's all sorts of other um uh, contraptions with uh sliding charger guide on the uh on the mark one uh the cutoff comes in and out of doctrine uh comes in and out of of the models but they liked it i've done a video explaining what the 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 purpose of of this was but, but uh, uh, maybe to sum that up on on this rifle the cutoff is a uh gives you a modicum of control of mm-hmm. the fire yep whereas a cutoff fitted to an smle is what kind of feature simply um a luxury feature sure basically. but perhaps perhaps maybe a safety feature yeah as opposed to something that governs the tactics and the operation of the rifle yeah this does not have one this is a mark three star simplify one this particular one is um, 1916, so an early Mark III star. Um, the Brits have this concept, still do, of loaded but not made ready. So, without the, I did a, I did a whole video on this, and I'll put a link in there. But uh, it's a way, particularly for a tired soldier, to have easy drill movement to put his rifle in a an intermediate state where the chamber's not loaded, but the magazine is. And, and that was how it's used. And uh, last seen as late as the number four trials rifles in the early 30s. As I said, it came back and in and in and out of, uh, of, uh, of fashion. But um, and the universal short rifle, um, about the same time the US did the same thing with the 1903 Springfield, 1903, in fact, SMLE Mark I is 1903. Parallel development, similar reasons. Uh, the cavalry, the Lee Enfield and Lee Metford cavalry carbines are really quite short and light and not very accurate and uh, puts you at a massive disadvantage. Um, you've got the lessons learned from mounted infantry. So uh, give everyone this, train everyone to shoot to the same standard and, uh, and, and crack on. Now in terms of the equipment, as soon as you get to chargers, you need a way to carry them. Um, here we end up with uh, pouches for 150 rounds although doctrinally a full ammo load was 120 which we've not quite worked out why no. and that's of course notwithstanding the the use of greatly excessive numbers of rounds carried by individuals for certain operations yeah yeah I mean, once once you get into use if you look at first world war era uh photos you'll see people with 150 rounds and then one or two 50 round bandoliers as well um Big problem here, in the Boer War, there was a lot of ammunition being dropped, uh, not only from these pouches, which do have holes in them, but there were lightweight cloth bandoliers that were worn. They were, weren't, in, it was a question of whether they were actually intended to be worn like that, but uh, the Boers could just go along behind British columns and pick up tons and tons and tons of three or three ammunition. And what's yeah. in, interesting is that the, this is canvas webbing, but the experience with the lightweight disposable canvas bandoliers biased the uh, the army structure against the use of webbing. This we didn't get from there to there immediately. There's an intermediate set of equipment, the uh, 1903 bandolier equipment, um, which also held 100 rounds, but uh, 
sort of characterised by, uh, for infantry, a 50 round bandolier and then another 50 rounds in, uh, in 10 and 15 round pouches on the belt made of leather. And you've got some experience with, uh, with this. I've never seen a full set of it in my life. The bandoliers are quite cool and they're seen as late as the Second World War for drivers and things like that. But the entire equipment really isn't. Once it was adopted, I think it was that immediate post-Boer War navel gazing. Uh, so the end of the war saw the massive use of bandoliers of many patterns. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was thought that this was the way forward. Mm. This, uh, the Boers carried their ammunition bandoliers, and the, the, the uh, imperial forces, uh, British and uh, empire forces that fought in South Africa, also mm-hmm. ended up carrying their ammunition and bandoliers. Of course, uh, those would have been uh, a setup for single rounds. So in this post-war era, they thought, well, bandolier is the way to go. Mm. But single rounds aren't. Mm. So this results, of course, in that very iconic five-pouch bandolier Mm -hmm. and nine-pouch for the cavalry. Uh, But those are designed to hold chargers, the individual wide pouches across the chest and on the belt, of course, as you've discussed. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's very found very quickly that it's a very ill-balanced and not a a very functional set of equipment. Mm. It doesn't have much in the way of utility. There's no... Apart from the haversack, which is a separate piece in that particular mm-hmm. set of equipment, there is no utility pouch, as it were. There's no mm. valise. There's no small pack. Uh, this is seen as something that uh, becomes increasingly important. Uh, that, despite the fact of lightening the load of the mm-hmm. infantry, there's physically no other way to carry all the things that you might carry with the 1903 pattern equipment. Mm-hmm. Uh, they see it is deficient in that way. Mm. And so what we see is the army's reassessment of its adoption, or shall we say readoption, of the canvas or cotton webbing, which results in the iconic uh, World War I set of equipment known as the 1908 pattern web equipment. And this has, uh, as mentioned, fun- capacity for 150, although perhaps less was carried as far as uh, regulations go. But it has uh, features of it that the 1903 and earlier patterns simply do not. And the, the biggest feature is apart from the uh, uh, ability to carry chargers is the fact that it is one piece of equipment when Mm. assembled that there's nothing crossing the chest as you can see here water bottle haversack uh, uh, which are separate pieces unto Mm. the set of equipment here those individual pieces of equipment are attached to the uh, and suspended from the belt there is a valise or or large pack carried on the rear and a haversack uh, for the same purposes of uh, as haversacks in the past, but to carry food and other small items mm-hmm. like that. So it is by far the most advanced set of equipment used and fielded by the armies going into World War I. Mm. And it lasted until the eve of World War II before it was replaced, but we'll get onto that another time. Now, uh, just uh, we've uh, been blathering on quite a long time. It's been fascinating. It's, uh, Love talking to people who are also enthusiastic about that kind of thing, and particularly when they know more than I do about the particular period we're talking about. It's always a good learning experience. But uh, doctrinally, we went away from sort of volley firing, firing on command, to still relatively tightly controlled, certainly compared to other armies, but independent firing, independent reloading. Um, it was the, the, after the load, of, the load command was given and the fire orders would be, for instance, uh, a target indication and a range indication, five rounds fire at the standard rate, or five rounds rapid fire, or just fire, so just keep firing until told to stop, and, and so on. And uh, there's no point in going into massive detail here because Rob's done a fantastic uh, uh, um, presentation of every aspect of this in as much geeky detail as uh, is humanly possible. And uh, again, without going into too much detail, it wasn't arrived at immediately. There's a, there's a sequence of uh, sort of intermediate steps that get us up there, just as the rifle advanced in increments over the various models from there to here, the Doctrine did as well. And then the eve of World War, World War I, we've got uh, the frontline army equipped mostly with uh, Mark III SMLEs, which was introduced in uh, 1907. Cited for 303 Mark 7 ammunition, a Spitzer, so pointed 
flat paced bullet, 174 grains at 2,240 feet per second after, out of this uh, shorter barrel. Um, and uh, occasionally you get, it's a very silly, pointless argument. My, my country's vastly overpowered cartridge is, uh, is uh, more vastly overpowered than your country's vastly overpowered cartridge. Oh, wait a minute. I think we're getting a little, uh, they're getting political here. I may have to step back. <laughs> I, I'm in solidarity with you. Yeah. It's like they're all overpowered. I mean, <laughs> yes, uh, that, that really is, sums it all up. Yeah. That, especially with hindsight, yeah. Yes, they are all massively overpowered. But we were thinking, what were you sighted to on the dial site on this? Um, 2,800 yards. I mean, it, this, I, I doubt these dial sites were ever actually used in anger, but they had the ballistics, so they thought, why don't we sight the rifles uh, for it? But, uh, I mean, that was retained. Uh, it was on the... the 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 early p14s that's as late as it mm -hmm. was retained and that's there there are there are, the brits weren't the only ones to have this kind of long range sight but their actual practical utility was probably zero right. um little one more weaponry aside the the pattern 13 the seven millimeter rifle that was converted into into the p14 in 303 during world war world war one as an emergency uh emergency uh, reserve arm that came out of this long range thinking and if you think these are massively overpowered we were talking a 165 grain um seven millimeter bullet at 2800 feet per second and the and the the, the metallurgy and the powder uh technology of the era couldn't hack that now this is actually a 280 uh, remington i think if i'm wrong i'll correct myself uh standard hunting load out of a case that's Basically, a 3006 case, more or less, necked to 7mm. Not a problem now. You can easily do those kinds of ballistics, but in the pre World War I uh, era, it was, uh, it was out. But that came out of that Boer War experience thinking. That uh, the, the Empire forces had been on the receiving end of Boer fire, mm. uh, that it was effective, and it was effective at very long range. Mm. But don't forget, we are talking about. Groups of people, mm -hmm. sometimes large groups of people, in the hundreds and whatnot, yeah. and it's not a single individual necessarily finding and locating mm -hmm. somebody at fifteen hundred yards. Yeah. But they know that the enemy is at about fifteen hundred yards. Sights are set to fifteen hundred yards, mm -hmm. and you can aim at features that are nearby yeah. or at the actual mass or in the case of a, a, an extension of troops, mm. but you can see where they are. And very much in the same sense uh, of the role of machine guns later mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. even from the Boer side, yeah. that their rifle fire is effective at these long ranges due to these factors. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the longer the range, the, f the higher the trajectory, uh, I'm sorry, the, the higher the velocity, the lower the trajectory, mm -hmm. the easier it is to hit a target. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not necessarily aiming specifically at that little tiny mm -hmm. black dot at these extended ranges, the effect of the massed rifle fire mm -hmm. puts a beaten zone yep. on top of your enemy. Mm -hmm. And it makes it a very dangerous place to be, mm -hmm. whether you're lying down or standing up. Mm -hmm. And as a result of this, how do we counter that? Yep. We need something that shoots even flatter, that shoots even faster. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, how do we do that? We just make something bigger and beefier. But the rifle can't handle it. Yeah. The metal can't handle yep. that increased uh, velocity and friction. So, mm. so uh, yeah. And then uh, First World War intervened. I, my view on that whole thing is it was never going anywhere because once you've once you've wound the ballistics back down to a dull roar, say 20, uh, 2,600 feet per second, you're getting... 160 feet per second more than this and but we've just adopted in 1910 this new cartridge and the rim jam issue is non non issue uh, anymore and because we fixed all of that it's it's all fixed what what do you mean we want to retool for this for this entirely new thing um, but we've got forces all over the place and now nah, uh, and then war were declared and forget about it i think i've heard that somewhere possibly i might be repetitive sometimes anyway if you survived this far, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much, Rob. It's been a fascinating discussion. I've enjoyed every minute of it. And there are many minutes. 
of it to uh, enjoy by this stage. It must be about 40 or something. Anyway, apologies for that. Please, uh, uh, if you haven't already liked and subscribed to both of our channels, British Muzzle Loaders and uh, Bloke on the Range, please do so. We're both on Patreon, so uh, please consider supporting us and uh, see you again sometime. Bye. Bye.